Welcome back to Carnegie.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Ordinary Set Theorem. Now, we have learned quite a bit of set theory in the last couple of weeks. To celebrate, I want to try a proof. Now, if you watched the original 100 Days of Logic, you saw that when we do proofs, we do very clear, line by line, very formal proofs that clearly state the axiom or rule of replacement we're using to get from one line to the next. That's what we're going to do here. It helps me to show really what's going on with the very detailed mechanics of what each of these axioms and statements mean. And hopefully it helps you to see the implications of all the definitions that we're using. What we're going to try to prove is something that I'm calling the ordinary set theory. This is the claim that for any class, there's a subclass which is not a member of that class. This is a more general version of our conclusion from the last video. Let's unpack that statement for a second. The claim that for any class, there is a subclass which exists, which is not a member of that class. How is that a more general version of the claim that not all sets are classes? Think about it for a second. The universal class is a class. Classes are by definition subclasses of the universal class. Sets are by definition members of the universal class. If we show that not all subclasses are members of a class, take the class we're talking about to the universal class. If not all subclasses, aka not all classes, are members of that class, are sets, then not all classes are sets. This is just a more general version which says not just for the universal class, but for all classes, this is the case. So to be clear, this is the axiom we want to prove. For all A, there exists a B such that B is a subclass of A and B is not a member of A. Note that before we've proved this, we are allowed to substitute classes and sets interchangeably because we haven't shown them to be different. But after we prove this, we won't be. We only have a limited supply of axioms at our disposal now, so it's going to be difficult, but I think we can do it. What I will say is, if you want a true big, big challenge, try this right now. But if you want a little bit of help, in the next slide, we're going to give you the first premise that helps with the separation axiom, the axiom of separation, because that is a complicated schema to wrap your head around, and we haven't really used an example of how you would instantiate the schema in a clear way. So if you want a challenge and you think you have a handle on it, try proving this line by line yourself. If you want a little bit of help, don't pause the video, and we're going to check it out on the next screen. So, this is a really tough proof to do formally. Since the axiom of separation is new, and we haven't really practiced with instantiating schemas, I'll give you the first pr premise, which is just an instantiation of that axiom as the ordinary set theory. So let's take a look at how we're instantiating this, just to get a sense of what mechanically is going on. The goal is to help you with, if you're seeing a long, complicated proof that does this line for line, you can understand really what they're talking about. So, for all A, there exists a B such that for all X, X is a member of B, if and only if X is a member of A, and X is not a member of itself. Remember, until we've proven that not all sets are classes, we can interchangeably instantiate classes into X. So, for all A, there exists a B such that for all X. What's happening here? Well, with the first half, we had that long list of A1, A2, A3, A4, all the way up to AN. Where's that gone? That's just turned into the for all A. We're basically saying we could have picked any number of classes to create this definition for our class B, but the only one we're going to pick is we're going to pick A. We're just going to take one. We only need one to do it. There exists some B. So that's saying there exists some class. That's going to be the class that x is a member of that we're defining with this. For all x, that's for all sets or for all classes in this case because we haven't shown that there's a difference between classes and sets yet. x is a member of b is materially equivalent to x is a member of a and x is not a member of itself. So the x is a member of b was just part of our axiom and then after that materially equivalence 
In the past, we had a little Greek letter and then something complicated after it. But in this case, what we have is we're instantiating a formula. That's what that means. We have an instantiation of a formula regarding all those variables that were listed after the Greek letter. And so we have x is a member of a and x is not a member of itself. That's just a formula. It's a series of variables and operations. Okay? So that's what we're starting with. That's our first premise. And from that premise, we can build up to the theorem of the ordinary set, or the ordinary set theorem. Give that a try on your own if you want. If not, here we go. So this is what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that for all A, there exists a B such that B is a subclass of A and B is not a member of A. So we're going to start with that separation axiom. We'll get our A's and our B's in there. The first thing we're going to do for a broad scope of the proof is we're going to first prove that B is a subclass of A, and then we're going to prove that B is not a member of A. Okay? So we start with the separation axiom, and then we're going to X universally instantiate the A, X essentially instantiate the B, and universally instantiate the X to get this. Basically, we're just taking off those quantifiers at the beginning. We're remembering that our variables from the end of the alphabet mean things that were universally generalized, or variables from the middle of the beginning of the alphabet means things that were existentially generalized. So we can't bring that L back with the universal generalization, but we could bring the Z or the Y back with the universal generalization. Okay? Now, we're going to split up that equivalent. So we're just basically going to pull out as many things from this statement as we can. So it's an equivalence. It's a biconditional. So we can conjoin two conditionals to be the same as it <clears throat> using equivalence. We can simplify that down to an implication. Then using implication, we can turn that into a disjunction, negating the antecedent and keeping the consequent, because all of our logical symbols can be defined in terms of just disjunction and negation. <clears throat> Then we're going to use distribution to distribute across, because we need to split up that <clears throat> conjunction. We want conjunction to be our main operator in the middle so that we can split and do simplifications. We can't do that if disjunction's in the middle. So we want to distribute across the conjunction so that we can pull out each of those sides. So we'll distribute across the conjunction, and we'll get these two different parts, each of which is a disjunction on its own. And then we'll simplify premise 8, and then we will take premise 9 and do implication on it. So we're turning that, once again, we're doing the reverse of what we did earlier. We're turning that back into an implication. And then we're going to universally generalize it. So like I said, the Z and the Y, we can universally generalize because we universally instantiated them to begin with. Well, look carefully at what this says. What have we just proven? We've just proven that for all X, if X is a member of L, then X is a member of Y. What does that look familiar to? Well, it should look familiar to the definition of subclass that we had earlier, the definition of a subset. And that's what we've been trying to prove. Because remember, L and is going to be back existentially generalized into B, and Y is going to be existential or universally generalized into A. So this is just our subclass. So this is the first half. We're doing pretty well, but the second half is going to be more complicated. So now we're just going to see if we can derive some more conclusions from those premises earlier. So we're going to simplify 5. We're going to get the other half of it. We're going to say Z is a member of Y and Z is not a member of Z implies that Z is a member of L. Then we're going to export out our Z is a member of Y. And then we're going to go ahead and simplify premise 8 down. Simplifying that gets us the other half of the premise that we didn't use previously. And this shouldn't be premise 8 simplification. It should be premise 15 implication. We're just doing the same implication trick that we did before. When we have a negation in the first half and a disjunction is the main operator, we can turn that into an implication very easily. All right. Now we're going to do an assumed indirect proof, and that's going to take us to the end. So those four statements in the middle are going to help us with this assumed indirect proof. We just wanted to get them out there before we got into it. What are we trying to prove in this assumed indirect proof? Well, we're trying to prove that... B is not a member of A. Well, L is a stand-in for B right now, and Y is a stand-in for A, so we're trying to show that L is not a member of Y. In order to do that, we need to do an assumed indirect proof around L is a member of Y. So we're going to assume that L is a member of Y. Then we're going to go ahead and conjoin 14 and 16. This gets us a couple of implications. And then we're going to universally generalize this to x. Why are we doing this? Because we want to then 
instantiate this to being L. Like I said, we haven't shown that all sets are not classes, so we're allowed to do this. So it might be count as a little bit of a fudge. If you struggled here and said, oh, well, I'm not allowed to instantiate that, I apologize. Then we're just going to go ahead and simplify this down and use modus ponens. So we had L as a member of Y already, so we can use that with 21 to get L is not a member of L implies that L is a member of L. Whew, that sounds problematic. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's actually not quite a contradiction. Because if L just was a member of itself, then you wouldn't have a problem with just that premise. But we're going to show some other things. From premise 20, we can simplify that down to L is a member of L implies that L is not a member of L. Uh-oh, now you have a problem. Because the only way you can get out of that is for L to not be a member of L, but the only way you can get out of the previous one is for L to be a member of L. This has the makings of a contradiction. So we're going to do the definition of non-membership because we're going to explicitly state the contradiction on both of them, and then we're going to do implication on both of them to get disjunctive statements. And then we're going to do tautology on both of them to reduce those disjunctions down to a single statement. And once we conjoin those, we have what is officially a contradiction by the exact same statement conjoined with its exact negation. That is a contradiction. If you thought we had a contradiction earlier, eh, you're correct, but we want to state it very explicitly to show that this is a contradiction, just in case there's some fudging in there that we could have done differently. So with that, we can conclude that it's not the case that L is a member of Y. And that's just what we wanted to conclude, because remember, L is going to generalize up into B, and Y is going to generalize up into A, so that was the second half of our statement. So with this and premise 12, we really have all the building blocks, we just need to generalize now. So we'll do the definition of non-membership to bring that negation inside and put a slash through our membership sign. We're going to conjoin those two premises. We're going to existentially generalize and then universally generalize to get are for all A, there exists a B such that B is a subclass of A and B is not a member of A, Q, E, D. Whew. If you were able to do that whole proof, props to you. It's quite difficult, uh, but great work if you were able to follow along. If you think I made any mistakes in here or you have any comments, please, please, please leave them in the comments below. We're going to call this specific statement, the ordinary set theorem for future proofs, because it's a useful statement to have. Up next, I want you to try three problems on your own. In the next video, we'll give the answers. We have, for all E, E is a subclass of itself. Remember, we said we were going to prove this, uh, but we just had a statement of it earlier. Number two, it's not the case that for all C and all D, C is a subclass of D implies that C is a member of D. So once again, this is one of those intuitive claims that we talked about, but we haven't offered a formal proof of. So saying that just because something is a subclass of something else, it doesn't mean that it's a member of that thing. We can now formally prove that. And finally, for all A and all B, if B is a subclass of A and A is a subclass of B, then A equals B. Try all three of those on your own. In the next video, we will give you the answers. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.